this episode, we are joined with Father Thomas Joseph White to discuss the Christology of St. Thomas Aquinas. During the later period of Aquinas' academic career, he started to compose the third section, or the Tertia Pars, of the Summa Theologiae, addressing, among other things, the life of Christ and the significance of the Incarnation. In the Tertia Pars, Aquinas makes several key contributions to the study of Christology, drawing from both patristic precedent and prior conciliar dogmatic pronouncements. Father White is the Rector Magnificus of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas in, in Rome. He is the author of various books and articles, including Wisdom in the Face of Modernity, A Study in Thomistic Natural Theology, The Incarnate Lord, A Thomistic Study in Christology, The Light of Christ, An Introduction to Catholicism, and most recently, The Trinity on the Nature and Mystery of the One God. He is the co-editor of the journal Nova et Vetera, a distinguished scholar of the McDonald Agape Foundation and a member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas. Father White, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Thanks so much. I'm really uh, grateful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So we, we do have quite a bit to uh, to discuss for, for this episode. And as we've said before, before we hopped on to record, I, we probably won't get to all of the questions that, 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 that I've been meaning to ask, but... I figured before we get into the weeds of Aquinas's uh, theological and philosophical commitments, we, we might sort of lay the groundwork of uh, the, the, the the conciliar dogmas that, that Aquinas is, is adhering to. Because even though Aquinas is very innovative in certain aspects of his Christology, he is also very careful to make sure to follow prior conciliar dogma. And, and one of these councils Aquinas is especially interested in is the Council of Chalcedon. So if I if I may ask uh, Father White, how did Chalcedon understand the relationship between Christ's humanity and, and, and divinity? As I understand, there, there's a very famously, there's what's called the Chalcedonian formula. Yeah, well, Chalced Chalcedon builds on Nicaea and Ephesus. Uh, Nicaea had promulgated the doctrine of the divinity of Christ, who's one in being and substance, or homoousius with the Father, and then the Second Council of Constantinople in 381 had promulgated the Holy Spirit as also God, and then you had Ephesus, which had promulgated in, uh, what, the fourth century, that, um, um, you know, my dates are maybe a little off here, but anyway, basically it promulgated that, uh, the fifth century, early fifth century, that Christ is a, a one divine person, uh, but it had not resolved the question of the relation or uh, of the two natures. And because you had monophysitism uh, formulated by various uh, monk theologians after that, which posited that there's only one nature after the union, Chalcedon articulated there are two distinct natures in the one divine person of Christ made man. So he is the eternal person, the word or son. And of course, it makes then the question arises to what it means to speak even of a divine person and a divine person subsisting as human. But in that uh, mystery of the word made human or the word made flesh, you have two distinct natures, the eternally subsistent divine nature of the son in which he's one with the father and the Holy Spirit as Lord and God and uh, our human nature distinctly in which Christ has a human body and soul and is a composite uh, of body and soul. I mean, he's an individual man like us in all things but sin. So one divine person subsisting in two natures. I see. And, and how does Aquinas understand uh, this union of of, of one of one hypostasis or, or one person uh, with, with these with with these two natures? Is, is is this unity sort of brought about accidentally, or, or in, in the way that like uh, a chair might be constructed of parts? I mean, how, how does Aquinas understand the unity of these two natures? Yeah, oh, so everyone in the 13th century wants to make sense of both Trinitarian doctrine and Christological doctrine because they share a common Catholic commitment to the idea that the doctrines express the teaching of divine revelation truthfully. So they're not adequate to all that God has revealed, but they do adequately reveal something real about God. That is to say, namely, that the scriptures, the apostolic tradition, teaches uh, rightfully and truthfully that God is the mystery of the Trinity and that God has become human in the person of Christ. And then we have to take responsibility for all these terms. And so you have this, you know, Greek terms like hypostasis and usia or essence, person and essence. You have uh, Latin terms like uh, persona and essentiae. 
that need to be um, just discussed. Okay, so when Aquinas gets to the hypostatic union, he's deeply impressed by the teaching of Cyril of Alexandria. He doesn't have that many of his writings directly, or any of his whole writings directly, it doesn't seem. But he has papal decrees from his time in the um, in the library in Orvieto on behalf of the Pope. He knows about condemnations in Nestorianism and subsequent conciliar definitions um, like Second Constantinople and Third, uh, Third Constantinople, uh, which are relevant. And then he um, uh, he's also knows quite well John Damascene in the Orthodox faith, which is a kind of a coherent and profound articulation of the of the principles of Byzantine uh, scholastic Christology that itself already took responsibility for the councils. Okay, so when he goes into it, what he wants to do is start with the in the beginning of the, the Tertiopars question two. The first principle of orientation is the unity of person. That in Christ there's only one person. That Nestorius is erroneous about the way he speaks about di distinct subjects, a man, Jesus, as distinct from the, the person of the word. There's only one subject to whom we attribute all the na nature attributes, be they divine or human. And so when we point at Jesus and say this person here, or even this man here, when we indicate the individual Christ, we are indi indicating the word made flesh, the person of the son of God, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, who is a human being and in that human being in that individual person who is the son of god made human then in questions you know uh, three four five six he goes on to say well, to articulate how it is that we can distinguish the two natures uh that the two natures are of course not separate and that the human nature is in a certain sense uh assumed into um how, the person of the word assumes a human nature um or I should say perhaps unites himself it's itself to the person unites the human nature to itself, uh, subsists in human nature. Um, and the human nature is, you might say, utterly related to the divine nature of Christ. The divine nature is not really related or it doesn't take on new properties and definitions uh, in virtue of the fact that of the, of the hypostatic union or virtue of, of the fact the incarnation. Right, so to answer, to your question now after that long preface i mean aquinas thinks it's he wants to talk about it as a substantial union uh, as opposed to an accidental union that's the big division among a lot of the medievals of the 13th 14th century is the incarnation a substantial union or is it a moral union or an accidental union so an accidental union could be like the way i relate to the the habit i'm wearing the religious habit i'm wearing i mean i do wear it habitually but it's not substantially me if it were lost or burned in a fire when I was traveling or whatever, I, I you know, I wear a different habit. I'm still the same person substantially. Um, or a moral union could be accidental and habitual. Like I work together closely with another priest for some apostolate. So it's a habitual union that's moral. You know, we work together. That's it. Um, then when you talk about substantial union, it's like the analogous to the union of the body and the soul or of the hand to the arm. It's one thing. Now, he doesn't mean by this that the incarnation can be understood in naturalistic and rationalistic terms just the way we understand a unified substance like um, a cow, a deer, a horse, a human being, a plant, uh, a planet. He thinks there's something really distinct and mysterious about God becoming human, but it is one being. You point at Christ and you see one being who is the word made human. It's interesting, the, the example that you give about uh how, how if you put on your habit you take it off you're still the same uh the, the same person because as i understand it during aquinas's time there were sort of iterations or versions of christology that were increasingly being viewed as nestorian in, in, in nature and in peter lombard's division of, of of the models of christology that he gives in the sentences one of them in particular is this idea that as i understand it uh, peter lombard puts forward the idea that christ assuming human nature is a bit like taking on a, a piece of clothing almost and it's it's sort of in that way that you can imagine the union of uh the, the two natures in in the word and aquinas sort of sees that as problematic yeah okay so i mean i'm i must say first i'm not a medievalist and there was a time and i knew a lot about this particular issue but i work more on modern modern theology and you know it's been a few years since i studied this assiduously but if I remember correctly, basically in the Lombard, which predates Aquinas, of course, there are three prevalent opinions. One is the basically this hypostatic substantial union theory, which Aquinas follows, and is, I think, more the mainstream theory. 
Another theory is what's called the homo assumptus theory. And this was followed by some, including uh, influential people like Alexander of Hales. And there's ways in which it has influenced later on SCOTUS. And e even up into the mid 20th century has influenced through various kinds of reception of SCOTUS theory. Um, basically, you know, it posits that there's a kind of, in a certain way, a, a substantial humanity, the, human, the humanity of Jesus Christ. And then there's the person of the word who comes into a sort of deep, unique, habitual relation to that humanity by assuming that humanity into itself. Um, but the union can be characterized more in by the use of the Aristotelian categories of accident than it can be helpfully uh, characterized by the uh, Aristotelian category of substance. Those people are worried about uh, um, monophysitism and kind of diminishing or not are denying the reality, the full reality of humanity of Christ. But it, it seems like, you know, the problem is they're going to end up compromising the full, full union. And it is interesting that Alexander, who doesn't know the councils as well as Aquinas, and that's not his own fault. They weren't as well known. Aquinas had that, you know, he had the advantage of working for a time for the Pope and going through the, the files in Orvieto and learning things. A lot of the Parisian scholastics didn't know in it as detailed a way. So, you know, um, Alexander trying to talk about this theory, he, he even gets close to saying there are two P persons, you know, in a, in a sort of qualified way. One hypostasis subsisting in, in kind of two, if I remember, I may be mischaracterizing Alexander, but I believe he talks about one hypostasis subsisting in two uh, pers personal, personal substances or personal forms of substance. And that's kind of creeping Nestorianism in, in unintentionally and indirectly. Uh, that there is a third opinion, which is that there's a kind of habitual, habitual but non-substantial relationship, both between the body and the soul of Christ as man, and between the soul and the word and the body and the word. And it's not clear that anybody really held this. It's more like a thought experiment, and it's just you know seriously problematic. And that's the kind of idea you were alluding to. Mm. So, but but Aquinas sort of takes the 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 first option that that, that it's it, it's a uh, it's a substantial union. This is. I at least initially taken to, to be the, the sort of mainstream position of uh, me medieval theologians of the 13th century. I mean, obviously there are outliers like Alexander of Hales, but it is Aquinas, mm -hmm. he, he's not unique in holding to the first position of no. uh, He's not unique. And I would say, you know, if you look into the, the like kind of long-term prerogatives of the magisterium in terms of like um, the 20th and 21st century, the articulations of the catechism. They don't use all the technical jar jargon of the scholastics, but it does seem that over time, the you know the subsistence theory is uh, the one you that that has the great you know the continuity. It allows you to understand in a more theoretical way what seems to be clearly continuous from Ephesus to Chalcedon to uh, the 13th century to modernity. Now there are you know su seriously important arguments about this including nuanced ways of interpreting Duns Scotus and uh, some modern Christologies that, that are derivative from his line of thinking in Franciscan and Jesuit writer authors, even up until recent times, who take, you know, who kind of contest this, this, uh, let's call it mainstream theory. So I don't want to, you know, deny that there are other ways to envisage things, but Aquinas is really in this way in the Greenwich time of, yeah. of, of theology. He's in the center, you know, of, of, of reference. I see. Okay. And then another uh, thesis, and I, I think we, we've alluded to it already, uh, that, that Aquinas has is this idea of the communication of idioms, that in the person uh, of the word, we're able to predicate things of the word through the, the, the two the two natures that subsist in, in the word, but it doesn't result in a sort of commingling of attributes as a result of the hypostatic union. So, so if, if if I can ask, what can you tell us about the communication of uh, of idioms? Yeah, okay, so that follows right from uh, the, the previous idea. And so I just say first, you know, the argument about communication of idioms is at the heart of the Council of Ephesus and the Council of Chalcedon. And I won't go into that, but I will just say that Aquinas formulates a theory that I think is very much in keeping with the center um, you know, the mainstream usage of the communication of idioms in the in the ancient world, but that I think gives greater clarity and expression to how it works. So my own version of explaining Aquinas on this is to say there's kind of three principles. First principle, 
all attributes of the human and divine natures, all nature terms, may be predicated only of the one person of the word made flesh. So if you say, um, you know, the son of God was born in a cave, you're predicating uh, nature terms that are proper to humanity to the word, person of the word. Or if you say, you know, the son of God raised the dead by divine power, then you're positing uh, a divine attribute and divine power to the person of the word made flesh. So the second rule is that you can't, uh, you cannot uh, attribute the nature predicates of one nature to the other directly. So you cannot say, just because God became human in Jesus Christ, the human nature of Christ is omnipresent, or the human nature of Christ is eternal, or the human nature of Christ is omnipotent, because that's to attribute to his human nature to things that are proper to him as God and Lord in his divine nature. You also cannot say that his divine nature is uh, temporal, historical, mutable, um, uh, subject to suffering and um, subject to death and extinction, uh, at least not just because he became human. Yeah. Uh, now, there are people who think God changes, and that's the divine nature changes. That's a sort of different argument. But, it, you know, because he did change, suffer, live in the history and die in his human nature, it does not follow, according to this line of thinking of Aquinas, that we can say those things are true of God in his deity or divine nature. The third rule is you can speak of the natures in concreto, uh, like saying Jesus of Jesus, this man, and then make attributions of either nature to the one who's uh, indicated by using the nature terms to speak in concreto. So I can point at Jesus. I'm pointing at a person. I'm naming the person using a nature term when I say this man. And I can say this man created the stars in virtue of his divine nature. Or I can say, I can point at him and say, I, I, you know, indicate him by using God, which is a nature term to indicate the person of the word and say, God died on the cross. I don't mean that God's deity died. I mean that God and the person, the son of God, the word died a human death. He experienced human death as a man on the cross. He was subject to death on the cross. So that's just the third kind of linguistic rule that helps make sense of a lot of patristic um, predications. And the reason this is one of the, there's many reasons this is important, but one is that once you get to Luther and then especially once you get to Hegel, uh, and there's the connections between the two through the medium of Lutheran scholastic traditions, it becomes commonplace in modernity to attribute, uh, the because of the incarnation in a certain sense, human attribute terms to the divine nature. And to talk about the fact that, for example, God became human and lived life among us, uh, the idea that God emptied himself of the prerogatives of his divine nature and took on finitude, um, powerlessness or a limited self-limitation of his divine power, ignorance, um, uh, that he took on, it, he took suffering into the divine life, that he became mutable in the divine life or nature. He died. Hegel tells us, you know, that God in a certain sense ceased to be in the moment of being that is God as son in uh, on good friday through the medium of, the, of the, the death of christ or that the dereliction descent of hell into hell happened in the very being of god or that the resurrection involves also a kind of rehabilitation and renovation of the very eternal life and nature of god you find that in jürgen moltmann who is a reform not lutheran but he he gets that partly through hegel and bart you know so this is his own unique interpretation of them so the, the point is that there's a whole new world of use of communication of idioms that arises in the Lutheran and then eventually 20th century reform traditions that comes from not agreeing, uh, going very different direction on that second rule. And that's different. You're not going to like figure this all out from studying medievals. Like the study the ancients, the medievals, you can get the principles by which you can differentiate, differentiate yourself from this modern tradition. But the modern tradition is doing something novel that did not happen before in the ancient world. And so, you know, there are maybe some adumbrations of it. Some people want to say you find people who do something like it. But I think it's really quite a novel uh, uh, 16th century and really essentially more 19th, 20th century form of thinking. I see. So if, if you can just if, if you can help me understand uh, the the communication of idioms better. So, so when we just des when we describe or when we say that God died on, on the cross, we are not saying that the divine essence underwent any sort of corruption or change or any sort of like passing away. We, we, what we what we mean to say when God died on the cross is that the assumed humanity that subsists in the word of, of God and in the divine person, the subject, 
underwent death, underwent corruption. And that that's what we're saying when we say when we say that the word that the term uh God died on on the cross, right? Yeah, I think you can say all that. I mean, I would say something even a little stronger, which I would say that the second person of the Trinity died on the cross. Uh, in fact, that's a teaching of one of the councils that one of the Trinity, uh, one of the one of the Trinity was crucified. One of the Trinity died on the cross. I think we have to say the person of the Word was born in a in a in a cave or in a manger. You know, was born in Bethlehem. The the person of the Word uh, developed in the womb of Mary. You know, from uh, conception to natural to uh, fully developed um, um, maturity as a, in his human nature as a child and was born. You know the person of the word uh, walked on the along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. The person of the word was tortured uh, and executed as a pr political prisoner and and was crucified and and died. And the person of the word was resurrected and glorified in his human nature, body and soul. So uh, those those are truths about the second person of the Trinity. They are not said rightly, nor should be said rightly, of the Father and the Spirit, because of the hypostatic union, and it's the subsistence of the Son, not the Father and the Spirit. Uh -huh. But none of that changes the nature of the of the Godhead, the divine nature, whatever mystery we, you know, that's itself a mystery we, we, we indicate, but it is a mystery we can indicate. Uh -huh. that the divine nature has not changed, and the, the, the conditions of Trinitarian unity be they pertaining to the divine relations, the eternal relations of the persons and their processions, or pertaining to the unity of essence, uh, are not changed by all that transpires in the life of Christ. Rather, the contrary, the life of the con life of Christ among us as man is the human manifestation in, in our world of the inner trinitarian relations and of the divine nature. You might say making it making making God present to us in a unique and much deeper way, not uh, a process by which God Himself evolves develops or perfects himself um by you know at our expense you might say so you, makes... you were you were saying so no well, here's one way to say it. Yeah. when you say everything you attribute everything to the divine person the good rule of thumb is say you know G, uh, the eternal the son of god uh, suffered in virtue of his human nature the son of god created the stars in virtue of his divine nature the son of god was tortured by the soldiers of Pontius Pilate, in virtue of his human nature, he could be. The Son of God uh, raised Lazarus from the dead by the power of God, in which he could do in the virtue of his divine nature. So if you, you just trap, attach that trope, in virtue of divine nature, virtue of human nature. Mm. But you do actually have to say these things happen to the second person of the Trinity, or that he did them. They're both, both activities and, you might say, the passivity of humanity, it's all attributed to the person of the Word. Mm. Right, right. I, it... That makes sense. I mean, I mean, one of the things that we need to avoid in in a trinitarian theology is, I believe, it's called Sibelianism, the, the idea that that um all, all all the that there is no distinction of persons in in the in in the Godhead, or maybe maybe that's not the right way of of saying it. it no, no, you got it, you yeah. got it, and that's going to be the philosophical temptation. Let's protect the divine nature. You know, the important thing is that these these things happened or done or happened by God in His human nature. They're not necessarily, we don't need to worry about the distinction of persons so much. The important thing is that the moral, uh, you might say, the power of atonement and the recreation of human nature through resurrection. And we don't need to worry about revelation of the Trinity or about real distinction of persons. But no, that's not true. Um, okay. There is a real distinction of, of three hypostatic modes of subsistence in God or three hypostases or, or persons. Now, you know, if you go in a very anthropomorphic direction there, you could end up with a kind of a... a three Cartesian consciousnesses, three Cartesian uh, psychological personalities, or even worse, you know, sort of three American modern um, clinical psychological personalities, some kind of grotesque anthropomorphism for what we tend to mean by a personal person as a subject of experiences. And then you you have this, gr you know, kind of gross, grotesque um, uh, polytheistic image of the Trinity. But, you know, so that's why you can't really talk about Christology deep down without having some qualified notions of Trinitarian personhood as well. Right. And and towards the end of, of the, the uh, of our inter interview, hopefully, if we get there, uh, maybe we, we can discuss some of the, uh, the Trinitarian theology that's related to uh, the, 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 the incarnation. But um, before, before we get to that, I figured maybe what we could do before, before that is, maybe discuss a little bit about uh, Aquinas' understanding of 
Christology and uh, this the, the psychology of uh, of Christ, uh, especially as it pertains to uh, Christ's human and divine intellect and the human and and, and, and divine uh, will. Um, if, if if that's all right, that's great. So one of the interesting things that Aquinas argues for um, in in his writings, and he's not the first one to argue for this. In fact, I think it has precedent in, uh, again, Lombard. But one of the the, the ideas that Aquinas has is that uh, Christ, the, the, the person Christ has in his human nature an intuitive self-knowledge of be- beatitude. Um, and, and, and how exactly does he, why, why does he think that that's the case? Is, is it a consequence of the hypostatic union that is uh, his human intellect uh, and when will by extension should know and love himself through beatitude how, how does that work out yeah so this is the famous controversy about the the, the beatific vision uh, of christ in his human intellect during his, his earthly life so when you start talking about the beatific vision or the beatific knowledge or the you know immediate intuition of of the knowledge of the divine essence in christ a lot of people cannot hear you because all they hear you talking about is they think, oh, he's talking about the divine nature being there's Christ as God. So there's divine knowledge in Christ, divine wisdom in Christ as God and it's beatific because God's happy. And that is wrong. Uh, it is true that Christ is God and Lord and that we posit divine knowledge in the Holy Trinity. That the Trinity is all wise in an incomprehensible way. And that in Christ, the wisdom of God was present, reconciling the world itself. You know, God is the wisdom of the wisdom. Christ is the wisdom of God, and he's God present in our human nature. So, yes, there's divine knowledge or divine wisdom in Christ. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the human knowledge of Christ. Did Jesus, as man, know he was God? How did he know it? What did he know? What's the extent of his knowledge? So, I mean, it's much older than the 13th century. But basically, there's a long tradition, especially in... um, Western patristic and eventually in Western medieval reflection on the perfection of Jesus's human knowledge. Basically, look at it this way. Uh, The medievals don't think that Jesus had a less perfect understanding of who he was than the church has of who Jesus is. Right. They don't think we 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 have something to teach Jesus about who he is in his human nature. Right. And if you look on the Gospels, Jesus looks like a person who has a lot of knowledge. Modern people could contest that some of that's all made, you know, some of this or all of it's all made up later by the church. And that's, you know, famous modern objection, suspicion, argument. And that's, you know, we put that to the side for the moment. That's a different sort of set of issues about historical probabilities in the evaluation of the depiction of the historical Jesus by the the four canonical gospels. What the medievals are worried about is more like the perfection argument. Did the savior know who he was? Did he know the father? Uh, He's instructing us. He has more perfect knowledge than us. He has more perfect knowledge than the prophets or Moses. So how do we understand that perfection of knowledge? And what they posited uh, and this is really an older, there's an older line of argument. They, they adopted an older patristic argument and developed it. They, pos- they, they posited, based on the tradition, that Jesus does not have faith in the way that uh, all others do. That is to say that he re- in having faith, you receive apostolic testimony, the teaching of others, and you believe it by the grace of faith, and your intellect can judge and assent to in a judgment but that uh, the revelation is true. I believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. It's been proclaimed to me. I, I've received the grace of faith. I judge it to be true by something more certain than ordinary uh, human certitudes of, of human faith. And I gain great insight, real insight, into the very mystery of Jesus raised from the dead in doing so. I'm enlightened. I'm illuminated. They don't think Jesus lived that way. They think Jesus had a higher intuitive and immediate awareness of his own identity, of the Father's identity, of the Holy Spirit's identity, and they had a perfect kind of um, human knowledge as man that makes him fittingly the head of the church. So he he knows best, you might say, what's the truth of, of about God and about his own self as man, about his own human life, his, his atonement, his, like the reason he came into this world, the mystery of our redemption, the mystery of the resurrection. He knows all that better than we do because he's got to communicate it to us. 
And when we're sanctified in understanding and in charity, we're not going to become holier or more knowledgeable than Christ. Rather, he's imparting to us a participation in his own holiness, his own wisdom, and his own charity, not just as, as you know God, but as man. We are the whole notion of the mystical body of Christ is that he's the head of the church in the order of grace, and he shares with us his capital grace, his habitual grace, and sanctifies the church who received from Christ grace and truth, as you find in the first, you know, uh, chapter of John's gospel. From him we have all received grace upon grace. You know, uh, through Moses there came the law, but through Christ comes grace and truth. This is Jesus as man, not only as God. So we need him to know a lot of things because he's sharing with us saving knowledge. Uh, in fact, that's what we see happening in all the Gospels. Okay, so if he doesn't have faith and he has some kind of intuitive understanding, then another thing follows that he's not really in the process of being saved. Jesus didn't come into this world to be saved, to like experience faith and in, and like the darkness of faith in order to hope one day that the Father would save him through the beatific vision. Jesus came into this world to save us. He's the Savior. And it's it, Aquinas argues in, uh, I think it's the Prima Pars question, uh, sorry, Tertia Pars question 11, that one of the reasons Christ, by a kind of necessity of fittingness, needs to or must have the beatific vision, not have faith, is that he's the Savior, and you can't communicate to others what you don't yourself first have, but only because Christ as man has the fullness of salvation, the enlightenment of his mind, and the plenitude of charity in his heart, can he communicate to us to participate in salvation. So what's at stake in part in this whole thing is like, what does it mean to say Jesus is Savior, that he's the head of the church, that he has the highest echelon of wisdom, that he can communicate certain and secure wisdom to others, that we can participate in authentic knowledge of the Trinity and of who Christ is and of the power of his atonement and of the mystery of his resurrection by listening to what Jesus teaches and by believing in him. So that, you know, that's, I think, the fundamental thing that's at stake in the doctrine of the beatific vision of Christ. So would it be correct then, and if, if I understand you correctly, Aquinas's motivations for positing this beatific uh, knowledge and, and, and charity in uh, in Christ is it's soteriological that like if if without the beatific vision, uh, Christ's sort of knowledge of himself, it would just be what would it be? It would predicate it wouldn't it would be predicated on on the grace of faith, right? Like that that would be all that he had. If you have to you have to posit a very high degree of faith, and I'm not I'm not claiming that's an incoherent claim. Well, I have argued that there's going to be real problems then about how he knows his own moral will, because Christ has two wills too. I mean, he's, he's the mystery of the divine, the mystery, and I say mystery because we don't really comprehend it. But the mystery of the divine will is residual in him. So, I mean, to consent to the divine will, which is his own will as a divine person, he needs to know the contingent will of God in every circumstance, because he is the Lord. In his human nature, in his human mind and heart, he's different than anybody else in their human nature because he's a human being who's God. He needs to con he needs to um, he needs to consent to and enact creatively, you might say, or like engage engagedly uh, the the divine will as a human as a human being in every circumstance of life as his own personal will because there's only one person, and it's very hard to see how he's going to do that really effectively habitually if he doesn't have beatific vision now he maybe could do it just through habitual uh, infused science kind of like a, a, a prophet with a lot of prophetic light happening all the time I, mean, I don't say it's ontologically impossible for god who can do anything that doesn't imply contradiction but it's it, it it seems like it would lead to less a vision of christ where there's less unity uh between the the, the human nature and the divine nature I, by the way i don't think it's just soteriological there's also anthropological reasons because Christ is the recapitulation of our human nature, the new Adam. And so there needs to be a kind of, there's a fitting perfection in him and he's head of the church. So there's ecclesiological reasons. There's sacramental reasons because he needs to in institute the, the sacraments and it's fitting that he should have the highest light or understanding of what the seven sacraments are and how they're to be instituted through the medium of either himself or the medium of the apostles by the powers he communicates to them. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, other factors in theology that come into considering why it's fitting that he has the beatific vision. I see. However, th him being in possession of the the beatific vision in his human uh, in his human nature and his human intellect that doesn't preclude uh, sort of uh, 
knowledge through through other means though like like because like, aquinas yeah. is going to want to say that christ has infused knowledge in, in a sort of habitual acquired knowledge you know he, he has other ways of, of acquiring knowledge yeah now aquinas is one of the first to make a okay uh, almost all the medievals in the 13th century western tradition are going to affirm that christ had um habitual prophetic or infused knowledge so he's like the greatest of prophets but where the other prophets receive where the prophets receive knowledge actualistically they don't habitually have prophetic capacity christ has it habitually like you can see that in the gospels that he can read souls and he can uh foretell the future it's just habitual it's regulated by economic um missionary you might say needs like the needs of the mission he's on to reveal the father and his and the kingdom of god and and redeem humanity and sin the spirit but he can habitually allude to a higher prophetic knowledge and understanding and aquinas thinks in a certain way he needs that to to um you might say mediate or communicate in a proportionate way what he otherwise can know only in an intuitive uh way through the beatific vision and not in a habitual way. Beatific vision is like seeing so you can't it's not it doesn't provide a way to habitually communicate um so he thinks there's a coordination between those two but then what aquinas develops more than any other medieval uh, up to his time is the idea of acquired natural knowledge and here he employ employs um he appeals to you could say broadly the aristotelian notion of developmental learning that he's acquired from you know his philosophical convictions to say look a human being naturally just learns through time makes choices through time so christ learns and makes decisions to uh through through time and the, these these things can coexist for him so he, he does think Aquinas does think that Christ um, grew in wisdom and stature, as it says in Luke, I think two fifty two, right. uh, following the kind of the child in the in the temple um, story, and that this has to do with the way he's you know you might say a participant in cultural a, a part, I would put it in this way a participant in a certain cultural linguistic context in which there's a uh, you know, learning through culture, learning through education and um, and language of experience and growing in understanding. Now, whether he depends on other people, to what extent he might learn things from other people, Aquinas thinks he can learns through his own experiences. He's not really de a dependent learner in the in the immediate sense. But you know, in, in any case, however you resolve that question about like whether Mary taught him to understand anything, and I do think that's a sensitive question. Where I'm, I'm sort of, you know, prejudiced in favor of thinking that Jesus doesn't really learn deep, deep insights into life from others because he's the Lord. The, however, you rule on that, you know, he's got to acquire some kind of physical experience of things like woodworking or the uses of language or the uses of prayer books, and he's going through an ordinary process of human, and he could then acquire also his own understanding of the world through experience and insight, and it, that would be deep. That that process might be deep and intensified in advance. By the higher forms of knowledge that are always there and around and that are you know being actuated or actuating that human acquisition of knowledge we don't know what that would be like but we can affirm that it's there and they kind of just look at the gospel see what look like its effects in him the best way to sort of see it phenomenologically is to read the four gospels you know which aquinas is trying to analyze he's trying to be um uh, he's trying to refer himself to and be faithful to the actual contours of what scripture shows about the person of christ mm. right and then moving on from discussing uh a, a christ's intellectual life and and, and, and his knowledge perhaps we, we can shift course in discussing how aquinas understands the two wills that that, that, that subsist in in the person of christ maybe because uh th th there's another sort of heresy that that aquinas it's not contemporaneous with his time obviously but there, there's a heresy that aquinas is reacting to to or, or against it's it's his thesis of um as i understand it it's monothelitism or the, the idea that there's only one will you, you you might say that subsists in in the word and it's the divine will because if you were to pause i think the concern is a mon monothelitist might say that if you pause it to wills well then you might lend to the possible lend itself to the possibility that you know christ might will something in the divine will and will something else in the human will and you know th th that well they're worried about they're worried about a kind of creeping nestorianism 
Okay. Yeah. So they, they, they're only saying there's two natures, but they don't want to say there's one, there's two wills because it sounds like then you get two agents, two subjects. Maybe you get two subjects, you have two persons, and then you don't have the, you're, you're denying the incarnation. Now, the Third Council of Constantinople basically, you know, um, vindicated the, the diothelitus position. The great representatives are Maximus, the, Maximus Confessor is the greatest representative. And then he influences other people like John Damascene, who directly influences Aquinas. And Aquinas takes up Dam Damascene's teaching and articulates it with some nuances that he adds of his own. Um, but I mean, the first one is kind of in keeping with the last point about acquired knowledge. He really thinks Jesus had all the different moments of voluntary activity, like, like Jesus had natural human um, loves, uh, volitional desires, uh, that he had intentions, that he, he reflected, that he made decisions. He had absolutely had real human choices, uh, that he followed through in the execution of those, that he had a human enjoyment and human love that were all um, dimensions of his volitional life. But that these are all happening, you might say, symphonically in subordinate harmony to the divine will, the will of the Father, that he not only knows, but in a certain way that indwells in him or that he possesses as the word in the word made flesh is the eternal will of the father that he shares with the father and with the holy spirit as indeed there's only one will in god so which is also taught by the third council of constantinople in the, in the, the writings of the pope at the time that were accepted as uh as uh, associated with that council hmm. so so you have to then enter into a kind of mystery about thinking, what does it mean for Christ to, you might developmentally, you know, learn, will, reflect as a human being in history. And at the same time, this is also ways in which, in and through all this, it's really the Son of God, the eternal word, who is coming to, passing through human thinking and deliberating through the Gospels to, to reveal to us transparently the will of his Father, the teaching of the Father, the kingdom of the Father. The, the the identity that he possesses as the son, the desire he has with the father to send the Holy Spirit upon the world for the remission of sins. Um, the, you know, this human agency that's genuine is not the human agency of simply a man who knows God well. It's the human agency of, of God, who is human, revealing to us in his genuine human nature, through his genuine historical life among us, the inner mystery of the divine community union of persons and the mystery of the persons themselves father son and holy spirit uh who are rendering their themselves present in in, in the kingdom of god and making that that mystery known to us and inviting us to participate in that mystery um you know so you get into kind of the, the heart of the gospel by thinking about things like christ's willing and his volitional agency and the aims of his ministry and what he's seeking to do mm, right so if, if, if I can say, or if I can ask, for Aquinas, you know, he's going to say that there's a human will and there's a divine will that subsists in, in the word and the person, the second person of, of the Trinity in, in Christ. Uh, is it possible for, for Aquinas that could there ever be a conflict in, in willing in the person Christ? Like, could Christ will something with his human will contrary to the divine will or how does he understand the relationship so here he, he, follows, he follows maximus and damascene and he develops it a little bit brilliantly and he distinguishes between the will of sensitivity or sensibility which is not really the volitional faculty but the animal reflexes like you know if i start to put your hand on the fire or if i um start to put a nail through your wrist to suspend you from a cross you could feel an instinctual, profound psychological reaction against that and want to withdraw. And that that kind of motion, he said, said things can be present in Christ. Um, but it's under the regency of the, of the will and the intellect so that it's always lived out in Christ as virtuous and as charitable and as acting in concord with the wisdom of God. So it's like psychologically in agony, he, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he can still master that to turn his, you might say, sensate animal psychology and fear or reserve toward uh, the acceptation with serenity and depth of the atoning power of the passion that he is to undergo. The second kind of willing is more, they talks about that can be intention with the divine will, 
is what he calls the natural will. He gets this from Damascene, if I'm not mistaken. The natural will, and that's the natural movement of the of the of the of the, the voluntary power as such away from an evil that one prefers not to endure. So, like this is where he says, "Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but Thy will be done." He, what Aquinas says is like, if you have to go into surgery and you know that you're going to suffer, I mean, this is before the age of anesthetic anesthesia. You know you're going to suffer, or you know we can say it after anesthesia, after in the age of anesthesia, because well, you're going to have a terrible recovery, you know, a difficult recovery. You you can choose your 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 will can reasonably move away from wanting to do it, but you choose rationally. We call the will as reasonable to go through the surgery in order to achieve the end of health. And similarly gives the, the, um, the uh, example of going a soldier going to battle. You're on the, you know, you're on the edge of the wall in world war one and you're going to the trench and you don't want to, because you're going to be in the midst of machine gun fire. And there's part of you that naturally really doesn't want to do that, but you have to surmount that by heroic fortitude and go over the edge of the wall by an act of d- d- uh, deliberate reason. So, the the will as reasonable can choose a higher good and subordinate uh, the the natural repulsion both of the sensibility and of the human will to do the higher good and so he thinks Christ could feel great sadness agony uh, anxiety or fear you might say and revulsion at the at the crucifixion for many reasons not just because of the natural pain but also because of the moral horror of he who's innocent and the, the son of God and it's the innocence itself and divine life being put to death by men, which is a, hor- a moral horror. I mean, it's the right. greatest moral horror, to, uh, strictly speaking, uh, that's ever transpired. And he, had, uh, in a way, I mean, there's controversy about saying that, but I think I think we can say in, in some real sense, it's the worst moral action that the human race has managed, although not, not with the same deliberation and understanding as some other things we've perpetuated. And in in um being but he's aware of the gravity of it and he's aware of the gravity of sins as he's dying for them in a way that we're not right so he can experience a lot of moral agony of the of the human will even as he chooses you might say like the resolute soldier to go into the battle of the cross to win and redeem humanity effectively okay Okay, and that's not the same thing. As, it's not the same thing as like deep temptation to sin. When sure. Aquinas says, "Can he be tempted?" He says, "Well, he could be tempted in the sense that temptations could be suggested to him, while either the most or the more grotesque kind, psychologically or more likely, because of the perfection of his sensibility, they would be suggested to him intellectually." Which is why the three temptations that the devil poses in Luke and Matthew's account are highly spiritual in kind. They're about you know, mis- misappropriating powers, messianic or divine powers, in order to cut corners. But they're basically, um, yes, he could be tempted. But Aquinas thinks it goes into the intellect. I mean, it can be it can be suggested the intellect, but it can't really, for Aquinas at least, it can't really deeply affect or begin to compromise the movements of the of the of the fervor of charity because Christ's charity is so perfect. They can't really be compromised in the sense of committing acts of sin or be, having first movements of sin. There's no, for Aquinas, there's not only no sins in Christ, there's not even first movements of sin. There's no first doubts or first, of the intellect or first um, residual turning away from the good toward the bad because of the, the pledge of the firm of charity in Christ. Mm. Okay. And then uh, with respect to another uh interesting uh maybe psychological is not the right word but but, but another interesting uh facet of aquinas's christology is that aquinas has a very interesting idea or way of understanding christ's prayer life so so, you know in the garden of gethsemane in addition to other examples in the gospels we receive accounts of of christ in in prayer um how does aquinas read these instances of, of of christ um praying well like like if if i can maybe rephrase the question a bit is is christ like a, a religious man in his human nature like does he petition the trinity does he adore the the, the trinity I and mean, how, how exactly does he read the prayer life of christ well okay so on the one side he says he's you know more human i mean he's human just as we are and 
he's more perfect in his human virtue than we are. So he's more more perfect in the human virtue of religion mm. and Christ, not only because of the nat the nature of religious justice, but also because of charity, the theological perfection of theological virtue of charity. Christ, as man, uh, loves and and prays to uh, the Father. So if we specify prayer. Uh, and obedience as human acts, acts proper to Christ as man, not God, this goes back to communication mediums, then we can say that Christ as man prays to the Father, obeys the Father, and as you might say, also the high priest of the Father. But um, if we ask, are those the acts of Christ, uh, of uh, a human person or a created person, the answer is decidedly no. So then what follows from that is, you have the divine person in his human nature, fittingly as man, praying and obeying the divine will, praying to God. However, now we get the second thing. So what one, one principle is perfection of human nature. Human nature uh, is religious, so he has a perfectly religious human nature. The other principle is the human nature of, of, of the son. So the acts of Christ as man are acts of the second person in relation to the Father and the Holy Spirit. So when he prays, he doesn't pray to uh, 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 the divine word as to another person. That would be weird, you know, like Christ is one person and he's praying to another person who is the word. That's Nestorian. All right. Instead, what you where Aquinas goes with that, that is, and this is the second principle, the, the the religious relationships, the, the personal relationships unveiled in Christ's human religiosity are intertrinitarian relationships. The, per, the, 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 the personal relationships unveiled in Christ's human religiosity are intertrinitarian relationships. So on the one hand, it's human to be religious, and he's perfectly human, so he's perfectly religious. On the other hand, he's the son of God who's, who's humanly religious. So when he's religious by praying, it's intertrinitarian. It's an intertrinitarian mystery. He's praying to the Father, and he's praying to the Father to send the Spirit upon the world, mm. you know. Um, and and so, you know, Christ's prayer is indicative of his eternal. In some ways, it's indirectly, it's indirectly, but really indicative of his of his of the eternal mystery of of the Godhead and of the inner Trinitarian relations of God. Um, and he's praised to the Father, I mean, really as like kind of a central motif. This is not Harnack or Schleiermacher where. You have a very holy man, a pious man, holier than St. Francis even, who prays to God and has discovered that God can be called our Father. That's liberal Protestantism. This is the eternal word of God who has become human, manifesting to us the pre-existent, transcendent, and eternal relation to the Father and to the word in the way that he as man addresses the Father. So when he prays to the Father, he prays as the eternal word of God made man, speaking to the Father, petitioning the Father, obeying the Father, and interceding to the Father for us as an act of the Son of God made human. Okay. I, the thing that I don't understand, though, is like, especially when it comes to petitionary prayer, like when he's, you know, praying in the garden that, that, that all, all, all shall be one. I mean, it, it it's not as though the, the, the son is any less omnipotent than the the, the father is, and it, 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 I mean, and the, the 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 second person is what's a, is um the, the the human nature is assumed into the second person of of, of the word, and, and the word is the God, the one is God, the one God. So I, I don't understand. I don't know if it if it makes sense. At least at least I maybe I just not I'm not understanding it correctly. Why? Well, is, Christ, your, is your objection a moral one that like he doesn't need to pray at all because he can already do it all as omnipotent, or is your objection like a kind of metaphysical one that like if he prays to the Father, he's just praying the same one who has the same Godhead as himself? No, so he might as well be. It, it's, it's more so the moral side. I mean, I mean, or not the moral in, in the sense that, that that he. I mean, he's just as omnipotent as the Father. I think that's just my, more more so my concern. Well, I mean, I'll, let me take both. Let me just take both those. Like, so on the moral side, like the whole incarnation is unnecessary as, I mean, if you say, well, he doesn't need to pray. He's omnipotent. He can just do all this. Well, he also doesn't need to obey. He doesn't need to be born in human nature. He doesn't need to like uh, suffer. He doesn't need to be resurrected. I mean, God could do all of that 
in our human nature without having ever become human, right? So there's got to be other things at stake in him living out a human life, including a human life of prayer. And at least two of them, uh, well, let's say maybe three. One is to reveal the Trinity to us in a human form through the human actions, Mm -hmm. including human actions that perfect us. It'd be strange if, if God became human to reveal himself to us in our human nature, but then did something that dehumanized us, right? He's going to rehumanize us. And that means making us people of prayer. The second thing is it gives us moral exemplarity of how to live in this world. And sh- and the third thing it sh- shows is, sol- is solidarity with us, is moral solidarity okay. with us. So it teaches us how to pray. The Our Father teaches us how to pray, right? They ask him. And he teaches them the Our Father. But that's the kind of participation, actually, through adoptive filial sonship in his natural sonship. So the Our Father is a really deep thing. It like, goes back into all this idea of like learning about the trinity and participating in the mystery of sonship the sonship of christ through adoptive grace uh and then knowing how to become our better human selves in the image of god redeemed by him in grace um on the on the side of the, the metaphysics um it, it's perfect you guys kind of you know we use language we kind of redouble our language all the time there's a two layers to it so if we talk about the divine nature we could say well when he plays to god if we consider god abstractly as like indicating the divine nature when christ you know in his human will subordinates himself to the divine will or prays to the divine nature he can't pray to the father not pray to the son to his own deity and to the holy spirit's deity yes that's true but um all acts are not just acts that we we pass toward uh personal natures but if 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 we refer ourselves to those who have personal natures we refer to those as those natures as persons so i don't I don't watch people, human beings, walk in the room and say, oh, human nature, please do this for me. I say, you know, oh, Rebecca or oh, Andrew, please can you do this or can I do that for you or whatever. Right. So when the thought when he's talking to the the divine nature, you might say he's, you know, concretely he's engaged in the relationship of person to person. And he's the second person. He's referring himself to the first person, typically, um, presumably could have prayed to the Holy Spirit, too. And I think he did. That would be a good question for like looking at scripture and also interpreting. But if he prays to the Father, if he prays to the Holy Spirit, he is suborning himself also to the divine will that's within himself as son, but he's not talking to himself like one human subject talking to another who's a divine subject. Mm-hmm. Rather, it's it's the divine person of the word in his human nature as a personal act, a human personal act, a human personal act of the Lord, praying to his father and praying to the Holy Spirit. And that reveals to us those inner Trinitarian relations. But yes, then we could say, it, it, Aquinas, Augustine famously asks, and Aquinas repeats the question, is Christ subject to himself in his human will? Is, is he obey himself? And Aquinas says, yes, he obeys himself. He's subject to himself. I don't like saying he praised himself because I think that's a different kind of personal act. Um, but I think it's right to say that his, his human will is religiously submitted to his divine will, obviously. I figured if it's all right, maybe we we're we're getting near near the end of our of our interview, but I figured maybe we can ask some um some closing questions. One of them I wanted to ask is how does Aquinas think that the incarnation itself is it is fitting? I mean, does he see it at all as being convenient or good for its own sake, apart from its obvious soteriological significance? I mean, what, what can you say to that? I mean, that's the famous dispute. So, I mean, the first thing Aquinas does say is that we don't know for sure, he thinks, that we don't know for sure if God would have become human had we never sinned. Mm. However, as he notes, the creed says, for us, for men, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And so the primary motive attributed uh, to God for the incarnation is redemptive and soteriological. That being said, even if you take that point of view, which I think Aquinas does, and I think the Thomas School certainly does, um, there's still the question of the benefits accrued to the creation and to the human race, you might say, in superabundance, in addition to or in and through the redemptive power of the incarnation, the atonement, the resurrection. That is to say, does the whole order of creation undergo a renewal, a reordering, and an elevation in the incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection a higher than it would have had we never sinned? And there, the Thomas School, you know, people reach different conclusions. 
Uh, so like one way to think about this, which is, I guess, the way I go. So I'll just, you know, answer your question as I see it best. I think there was real loss when we lost. I don't think God rewards sin with uh, an always better situation. Uh, there is real loss when there's sin and the human race that fell into death and, you know, damnation, or at least seems to be threatened by damnation. It looks likely from consulting the tradition that damnation is the outcome for a lot of people and some angels for sure. Um, you know, that's, that's a loss. And I think we have to like really deal with the reality of evil and not try to use Christianity to deny the reality of evil around us and in us. Uh, but on the other side, some of the effects of grace that are achieved through the hypostatic order, the hypostatic union, seem to be greater than any that could have happened had God never become human. And I, you know, would say they're the grace of Christ himself in his human sanctification, his human nature which is obviously far holier than anything that could have possibly happened had God mm -hmm. never become human. But then also the divine eternity, Aquinas names that one, the friendships that the apostles have with Christ and that, that place them in this direct kind of order to the mystery of the hypostatic union and holiness of grace, the greatness of martyrdom, uh, the sacrifices that many people make in a fallen world that are heroic, the way people can suffer even death. Uh, to grow closer to God, and that's actually quite common. I mean, it's not something reserved just to the martyrs. It's something, in a way, communicated uh, almost, you might say, with the grace of baptism. We we die in Christ, but that means, like, in our human nature when we die, we can be united with Christ uh, through our baptismal grace. That's a massive grace, uh, even though it's paradoxical because we're dying, and yet we can live through it to, unto Christ. Um, religious celibacy, um, and, even, and also marital ch chastity, uh, by which I mean, you know, marital fidelity and the chaste, you know, enjoyment of conjugal relations, that's fidelity to God. These are harder because of the fallen character of, of the world we live in and concupiscence and sin. And so persevering in them is a way that people um, gain great merit. Um, and then there's the Eucharist and the other sacraments, because the Eucharist is this kind of new and high form of a mysterious perfect presence of God in our world that probably would never have existed had we never sinned you know so I think you can talk about a lot of things that are probably better in the order of grace because of the incarnation mm -hmm. as long as you are also clear that we lost a lot and we've damaged ourselves and we're all threatened by sin death and, and damnation and redemption is really an ongoing process in which we need to orient ourselves toward the the high path and away from the, the downward path mm. i see yeah I, a, a while ago we, we we did have a have a guest on to discuss uh that that that, that technical debate among you know thomists and scotus about uh the the, the primary motive of, of the incarnation and we, 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 there's a particularly interesting position that that we discussed from, from that come out of the school of salmaka the salmata chances where they kind of try to synthesize both uh I'm sorry, I'm going off of, of a tangent. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that makes sense. I consider that a, I consider that a Thomistic school, um, and it, and it is it is a, a it's a position well worth considering. Mm. And even um, even though that Aquinas thinks that theoretically each of the divine persons could become incarnate, does he see it at all? Especially fitting that the Son or word should become incarnate? I ask this question, especially because I know that in the 20th century, this is very much a, 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 hot, a hotly contested issue. Yeah, well, mostly just because we're on are saying that only the Son could become incarnate. Look, at, I mean, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God, okay? So that's a doctrine of the church, and God is omnipotent. He has created the world. We confess in the creed that God is almighty and omnipotent. If the three persons are omnipotent and they, they are the, the one God who is the creator of the world, they have the omnipotent power to become uh, incarnate, and they, they share it as the one God. So to say that one of the persons of the Trinity could not become incarnate seems to me to be a denial either of the omnipotence of God and therefore the divinity of God or the creation, the power of creation, or it's a denial of the Trinity or you know something. So something's gone very, very wrong. If you're denying that the possibility of of any of the three persons to subsist in the human nature, uh, it seems to be the way of folly and just like ill-considered like theological superficiality. Um, mm. But you know, okay, I understand that people don't want us doing thought experiments about possible worlds in so-called science fiction theology. But that's not science fiction to say that 
um, God can do all kinds of things he hasn't done just because of who God is. It's actually helpful as a way of not being science, science fiction oriented, but of looking at who God really is. But secondly, then, yeah, Aquinas, having noted that all three persons being God could become incarnate, it's then important that the second person became incarnate. And he gives reasons because it has to do with the ordering of the personal life of God in the Trinity. And that's its bearing on creation. So eternally, the son is the eternally begotten wisdom and word of the father and is best understood according to an analogy from the procession of intellectual life. So then we rightly say that God has created all things in the word and through them. You might say as the transcendent model and exemplar uh, principle of intelligibility in and through which all things have been created. And therefore, when God recreates, he recreates in grace in and through the word. So it's, it's, it's fitting in a certain sense that God should manifest himself in the word. And Christ gives several other reasons. And, you know, you could look at them there in um, this, the first question of the third year parts. But, you know, just to say anthropologically on the corollary, intelligence, Aquinas tells us, it's proper to intelligence to manifest itself. Love is actually a little bit more, less perceptible. It can be, become manifest. But love is attending toward the other. So love is not always initially manifest because you it's an orientation toward the beloved. Intelligence is the taking in of the external world, world, but then it's the manifestation of intelligence through speaking. So if if the you know if God is to manifest Himself, then in God there is an eternal life of the begetting, the eternal begetting of the immateriality of the Word. It seems like a kind of fittingness that God should manifest Himself in truth through the medium of truth beyond all other mediums. That is to say, through the medium of the eternal Word made man. So yeah, there's arguments for fittingness. They don't require. You can't from them conclude that God had to become incarnate or they had to become incarnate in the way he did. It's very important that God is like made himself human or become human freely. But there's a kind of an inner intelligibility to it at the same time that leads us back into thinking about who the Trinity is. And as I'm intimating on the anthropological side, like a little bit into who we are as being made in the image of the Trinity. I see. Okay. Well, Father White, like th this has been a great conversation. I, I thank you so much for for, for coming on. If, if if I can ask maybe just a closing question, do you have any book recommendations for for folks who'd who'd want to learn more about uh, Thomas Aquinas and his Christology? Obviously, there's the Tertia Pars and and Aquinas's writings, but but do do you have any sort of secondary literature you'd recommend? Okay, so the main people have written on this in recent years. There's John Pierre Torrell. Uh, uh, Gilles Emery writes mostly on the Trinity, but he has some important things to say about Christology that are connected. And as you, this interview has made you know clear, in Aquinas at least, Trinitarian and Christological thinking are deeply inter interconnected. I have a book on um, called The Incarnate Lord that's on this topic. I recently wrote a, a book on the Trinity that has a whole last section on the economic activity of the Trinity, and it, it really finishes with a, a, a hundred pages of Christology. Um, Dominic Legg has an important book called The uh, Trinitarian Christology of St. Thomas Aquinas from Oxford University Press. That's important work. Um, you know, there's other things that are coming out. Simon Gain has a book, Did the Savior See the Father, which is about the beatific vision of Christ. So that's a, those are all good starting points. And then there's, you know, new books and monographs and articles appearing regularly now on, on Aquinas' Christology. Um, so I would just, uh, the Thomistic, uh, the Thomistic, Resource Malt series at Catholic University of America is publishing a lot in this area. And the, the academic journal Nova et Vetra, which is edited by Matthew Levering, which I'm honored to be associated with as co-editor, uh, puts out a lot of articles of Thomistic Christology. Okay. As well okay. as the Thomas, Thomas from the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. Okay. I'll, I'll be sure to, to, to link as much as the, of that in, in the, uh, the, 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 the YouTube uh, post. Okay, good. Um, Father White, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me.